there are about 53,000 self storage facilities in the U S and, um, up to 60 to 70% of those are, you know, are owned by mom and pop or small operators. I mean, that's the, basically that's 53,000 is the same as all the Starbucks, McDonald's and Subway's combined. Wow. Yet a large percentage are mom and pop owned. Some of those are in the path of progress. Some of them have vacant land with them. Some mm-hmm. of them, you know, um, a lot of them, the, the operators don't, they're not pros. They don't care to be pros. They're making enough money as it is. We can pay them a really nice amount of money and they can sell, move on to retirement. And then they can, those can be upgraded significantly. This is the real estate investing experience. We get it. Real estate can be rough sometimes. And that's why we bring in the experts to talk about the experiences you won't hear anywhere else with your hosts, John Cohen and Chris Grinzik. And welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Investing Experience. I'm one of your hosts, Chris Grenzig. And by my side, like always, is John Cohen. John, how are we doing? I got no complaints. Uh, summer's going good and yeah. uh, I'm happy. Yeah. I and mean, you just spent two <laughs> weeks up in Lake George. Why we haven't done one in a little while, but that must have been uh, I did. definitely very nice. I was on I'm vacation. Uh, I was on vacation for a little bit. Um, I wasn't able to get up to the lake as much as normal because we just—I just had a you know—I have a five-month-old daughter, uh, but we did enjoy it. She mm-hmm. loved it, so we're actually going back up this week, uh, and go. I'll be filming our next. We'll be filming the next one. I'm bringing the stuff with me so I could uh, so I could <laughs> film it so I could film it up there. But there um, I got no complaints. I expect the background just to be picture perfect lake. Of the lake, yeah, yeah. no nice and pristine, one. <laughs> exactly. Just so thinking, it feels like I'm there. I was thinking about how I should do it, how I should set it up. So I'm sure it'll be a. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be interesting. Oh, it will. Awesome, um, but I'm excited. We got a you know, really good guest in today. I think it's going to be interesting because he did what we did or we do, um, and kind of moved over to a different little aspect of it. He's also got, you know, his own podcast and, you know, has a really interesting backstory as well coming from, you know, kind of a rags to riches story. So I think we'll touch on a a lot of interesting things. I know, you know, him much better than I do. I think you guys are on, uh, is he part of the mastermind? Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've, we've spoken for a little while now. Uh, We have a mastermind group that we, uh, there's like six of us or seven mm-hmm. of us, or there was seven of us. Now it's, I think, down to like four or five. But, <laughs> That's how it kind of goes. But we're, uh, we're hanging in there. Paul's a great guy. Yeah, awesome. But without, you know, going too much into it, Paul, thanks for joining us. Hey, you bet. Glad to be here. Awesome. So why don't you just uh, kind of dive two feet in, you know, give us your background a little bit, um, you know, real estate, life, um, what you're doing now, how you got there, the whole shebang. Absolutely. Well, I went to, uh, I got an engineering degree, which was my first mistake. And uh, that was uh, basically, I didn't didn't really know myself, you know, I didn't know that that was not what I was suited for. Thankfully, I got an MBA after that, went to Ford Motor Company in Detroit, had a great time there, but I always found myself trying to find a side hustle. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I realized that I should have been an entrepreneur. And so I started a staffing firm with a partner. We um, had a really good run for five years, sold it to a publicly traded firm. Uh, And then I found myself at like 34 years old thinking, I'm an investor now. (laughs) And uh, I didn't know the first thing about investing. I knew about speculating. Mm -hmm. And you know, they say that when you have a lot of money, you have all these new opportunities to invest. Well, you also have a good opportunity to be ripped off and uh, to fall for scams and stupid investments. And so I did a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And, um, but uh, eventually, you know, we all, some of, some of the things I did worked out, eventually got into flipping houses, uh, flipped dozens and dozens of houses, flipped some expensive waterfront lots at Smith Mountain Lake in Virginia, and uh, built a subdivision, built seven or eight houses myself, and eventually got into multifamily after about a decade of all that. Wow, that's definitely a lot of stuff. Um, what is kind of the, the, the timeline that, you know, like, when did you start uh, each kind of phase of the different, you know, real estate backgrounds? Yeah, uh, I invested in a commercial project in 1999. Then I started flipping houses in 2000, started doing ground up or, or modular construction in 2003, started flipping lots at Smith Mill Lake in 2004. Um, 
did a subdivision in 2008, uh, got into multifamily in 2011 in North Dakota in the Bakken oil boom. Um, and that's, then, uh, that's very different from a region you typically hear people getting involved in. No, I'm not. kidding. Yeah, we were leasing, we, we built all these really high end cabins for oil workers there. And, you know, typical lease rates in the heartland of America are about a dollar a square foot a month, you know, mm -hmm. like an 800 square foot apartment might rent for 800 bucks. Sure. We were leasing for $13 a square foot and mm -hmm. staying pretty full. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a big uptick. Yeah, we had 300 square foot units, really nice high end granite countertops, all that. But, you know, these worker, these oil workers were staying in RVs or, you know, campers. And this was sure. a huge uptick for them. And um, we were charging hotel rates like $129 a night, about $4,000 a month Wow! and uh, getting it. And so we did real well with that, sold that. Uh, built a Hyatt hotel after that, and everything that went right with the multifamily, I guess, went wrong with the Hyatt hotel. <laughs> um, just a litany of problems, and mm -hmm. and, it, and I ended up going back to Class B value add multifamily. Wrote mm -hmm. a book on that in 2016, and then, like we talked about earlier, I expanded into the equity space about a year and a half ago. We've uh, we're now funding self storage, mobile home parks, and multifamily. Nice. I guess let's just you know dive into that because it's interesting for me. Um, you know, how many you know deals or units or whatever did you kind of do as you know syndicator, sponsor, whatever you say, and then kind of what was your thought process? You know, changing the game plan over into the you know, the equity, private equity fund side of things. Yeah. So not counting all the individual and smaller deals I did over the years, which was, mm -hmm. you know, close to a hundred probably, uh, as in multifamily, we had the 150 unit, um, ground up construction that we owned and operated for years. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in uh, multifamily, in the class B value add, we did one large deal in Lexington, Kentucky, 125 unit townhome facility. Mm -hmm. And that's when we expanded out into equities last year. John's been with me through this process. He's seen, you know, I'm a little bit older than you guys. And, you know, I, I just, uh, I had speculated over the years in other things and I just was not willing to overpay for assets. And of course I sat on the sidelines while John and, Michael Blanc and others mm -hmm. did really, really well. But at the time, you know, it seemed like the prices that were being paid were really high, yeah. but obviously it went up even further. And, you know, who knows with negative interest rates around the corner, maybe they'll go up higher even more, you know, I don't know. It's, it's crazy. Cause I, I, I felt the same way, right? So we, early on, there are deals that are coming back out to market now, and I'm sure you've seen them, that we passed on three years ago. So I, th I thought the price was crazy. Right. And now they're getting, you know, they're, they're even way, higher. it's even higher than what we projected a sale in five higher, years. Yeah. And it's like, you know, woulda, coulda, shoulda, right? Now right. I was lucky and we were lucky at Toro that, you know, there were deals that we were opportunistic on that would I buy them today? No shot. Yeah. But we did it. And we were able to execute a business plan, which was, which was awesome. But now even today, and I was on a call earlier with a, with an investor, uh, a guy that's looking to invest, you know, he's a good, good guy out of California. And he said, uh, you know, I, I want to invest with a group that's more long-term focused because, you know, I don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of years. And I said, well, listen, you know, we go into deals trying to execute business plans. You know, sometimes they happen quicker. Sometimes they don't, they, they take a little bit longer, but I can't promise you that I'm going to hold your money for 10 years. It's, that's not what the business plan is. And, and I didn't know what, you know, I, I didn't know what to tell them other than, listen, we're going to do the best we can. Well, you know, our deals, we used to underwrite to three years. Now we underwrite five to seven because mm -hmm. we're just, you know, shooting for longer. But I said, there's a good shot that we sell the deal in two years, three years, four years. Uh, I said, you have the opportunity to 1031 and roll it over and so on and so forth. And he was like, well, I'm really looking for more of a, you know, 10 year commitment. I said, well, I have some guys, your guy that came to mind, you know, in a potential fund or, you know, into that. I said, you should look for that as opposed to looking for a direct sponsor. But be that mm -hmm. as it may, um, we were lucky we took advantage and we speculated good, right? Because they're, they're, yeah. you can underwrite the best you can, but there's still level of unknowns. And today that's even more so. And I, I love what you're doing now. Um, right. 
I think it's really, I think it's really creative. Yeah. Can, can you kind of dive into a little bit more, tell us exactly, you know, what it is you are doing today and you know, how it differentiates from what we're doing? Yeah. So 93% of multifamily over 50 units has a, a corporate owner, which often means that the value has been wrung out of those and there's not a whole lot of value add left. Mm-hmm. Now, there are about 53,000 self-storage facilities in the U.S. and um, up to 60 to 70% of those are, you know, are owned by mom and pop or small operators. I mean, that's the Basically, that's 53,000 is the same as all the Starbucks, McDonald's, and Subways combined. Wow. Yet, a large percentage are mom and pop owned. Some of those are in the path of progress. Some of them have vacant land with them. Some mm-hmm. of them, you know, um, a lot of them, the, the operators don't, they're not pros. They don't care to be pros. They're making enough money as it is. We can pay them a really nice amount of money and they can sell, move on to retirement, and then they can, those can be upgraded significantly. And hopefully later we'll talk about the value formula for commercial real estate, which you guys are familiar with. Mm-hmm. But uh, the value formula, the, the, you know, the opportunity to force appreciation in these facilities might you know, might allow the operator to provide a, you know, 10%, for example, cash on cash return to the investor, but, you know, a hundred percent equity growth over a couple years Mm -hmm. uh, because there's so much upside, so much meat on the bone. And it's very similar with mobile home parks. So we realized this a year and a half ago, but we also realized we didn't have a team to do it. We didn't, we hadn't lived through the recession. We hadn't, been operating mobile home parks or self storage. And so we thought, you know, it would be smarter for us to find best in class operators who are really crushing it, who have a great team, and we would be better off to invest with them. We will be the money raisers. We'll get a kind of a premium deal with them where they give us a little extra spiff for raising the money, you Mm -hmm. know, for, or for, you know, not for raising it, but, but for bringing a large amount of money, I should say. And then we'll pass that along to the investors, which we do. And that gives the investors an offset to our, you know, relatively small fee that we charge for managing the money. So that's what Wellings Capital does now. That's, that's awesome because you touched on the mobile home side of you touched on the self storage side. So one thing that we made a conscious effort in, in 2017 was to educate ourselves in mobile home space. So yeah. we, we have 12 mobile home parks under contract right now. Awesome. Yeah. And yeah. it's all, so the, a law just got passed in New York for rent stabilization and it's a disaster. Uh, we, we it's, it's a bona fide disaster what they just passed on, you know, rent laws. It's, it's horrible. So we use that as an opportunity to go into the mobile home space and I live in New York and it, it, it was okay. We live here so we can operate this. We can drive there. We can do it. We know how to do it on the multifamily side. We are learning on the mobile home side. I bought a deal in 2017 with my buddy, small, to learn how to operate it. But the stats in mobile home parks, there's 40,000 parks. Yeah. Only 4,000 of those parks are owned by professionals yeah. and groups like, you know, professional corporate managed Right. Uh, companies there's 40 000. self-certified professional exactly, exactly. <laughs> um and then there's forty thousand parks that are or thirty five thousand parks that are mom and pop owned and we're dealing you know we were on a call right before this with a lady who the, she split a park with her neighbor because her neighbor put an infrastructure in she's paying the water she want it's it's crazy the stories we're coming across but I am so bullish on the mobile home space. You know, we have 12 under contract. It's about $8 million in total capital. Uh, and we're working through contracts. We just, you know, we're getting FedEx boxes in the mail now, which is documents, so tax returns. And it's crazy. So it's a space that I love also um, because the mobile, the multifamily side is nuts. I mean, yeah. you know it, you made the leap, right? It's like, I'm, I'll give it to a guy that knows what he's doing, but you know, to try and compete with, professionals like ourselves, you, you, me, um, there's less meat on the bone. It's so hard to find the right opportunities. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we've bought one deal this year. Uh, It was a three property portfolio, but it was one. Uh, We have another deal under contract that we're going to close. It was two properties. That's it. And, you know, we're looking for an alternative and, and 2018 and 2017 were education. Uh, we bought one, we, we messed around with it. We figured it out, but the mo- mo- the mobile home space very similar to self storage um, it's super attractive we like it you touched on it 
and you just gotta you gotta find the right person that knows how to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, we're right. not we're we're putting our own capital in. We're also raising money like we normally do. We're gonna try and we're, we think we know what we're doing, <laughs> but uh, it's just different. And and you've gone to the other side of it by basically you know hey we'll be the equity. We'll work with a sponsor. We'll work out a deal. We'll figure it out. And you know you guys give the investors X. We, you know operators do why but it's you know we're actually launching a, something similar or we mm-hmm. can talk about it i don't know if it's gonna happen this year but it's like a you know a potential preferred equity fund for all our own deals so you mm-hmm. give the investors the opportunity to take advantage of a pref as well as a common equity investment so they have that buffer of a pref but it's like an internal pref so it's not a third-party company or it, mm-hmm. it's a, its own thing and it's something that transition it was easy for us to talk about it because we had one investor back out of us on the last minute. Mm-hmm. It was a $2 million pref on the deal. So we mm-hmm. went to one of our investors and we said, Hey, what do you think about this position? He's like, I'll do it. And he just wrote the check, but it was, you know, thank God for him because what would have happened? And once we saw that, we started feeding that out to our investors. Um, it worked out really well. I mean, I think we're going to, we want to put something together. Uh, the question I have for you, cause you've done it is, the open end, close end, blind, do you have, do you have, when you guys, you know, Wellings Capital, you know, whether it's fund one, two, three, or whatever it is, did you, spe- you know, specify like here 20 deals? Because the problem we ran into is people said, I love it, but what is it going into? And don't tell me it's going into multifamily in the Southeast. I want to know 10 properties and you're going to buy three of them. That, that's yeah. been the biggest <clears throat> challenge from our, you know, our immediate network. Yeah, you know, Warren Buffett made a decision to fund billions and billions of dollars with Tom Murphy when Capital Cities uh, bought ABC back in the, I think it was the 80s. And he made that decision in 15 minutes because he trusted the operator. He trusted Tom Murphy. He didn't do a due diligence site visit or anything else. He already knew Tom. And super, super important that investors get to know their syndicator, their operator, that they, you know, really know, like, and trust you. And then they're in a position, you're in a position to be able to tell them, hey, we don't know exactly what it's going into, but here are the parameters. You know, it's going to be self-storage, multifamily, mobile home parks, whatever. It's going to look like this. It'll have these parameters and we won't do it if it doesn't. So I guess you could say it maybe a semi-blind pool where we basically say, here are the parameters, here are the asset classes, but we don't know exactly what we're going to invest in. We decided to do it that way. And then we put a closed date on it. Basically by December 31st this year, we're going to stop raising money for the funds we have. There are two funds and we're going to open up new ones or maybe one new one in 2020 next year. Um, but that's how we decide to do it. We're only taking money when we have deals to invest in as well. In other words, we're taking money in, let's say September to invest October 1st. And that's it. We're not holding any cash. No, that, that was going to be my next question. Mm-hmm. Cause we've, I've spoken to a ton of people, you know, some people have, you know, give me 10% now. And then there's a call date in the future. And when you, when we have really good relationship with our investors and I think you touched it, you know, you, you nailed it when you said, you, you, you got to have trust, right? Cause it doesn't, everything else is out the window. You got to make sure that the guys, you know, everyone's going to go to bat when stuff gets, you know, when it gets ugly, cause when stuff's going good, nobody, cares. no one cares. It's just when it goes yeah. the other way. Um, and I think that's the challenge with a lot of people looking to do it. I know that, you know, we, you know, we've scratched the surface. We've sat down with our attorneys to draw the documents and, and that, and the, the, the question I always get is, you know, when's the call day? What's this? What are you doing? And I tell them, well, I don't, I don't want to take your money now. You know, but I want it to be available in the future. And it's like, I want to have my cake and eat it too. Yeah, I'm just going to say, <laughs> but, but you know, you're, you're doing it that way and it's working by basically saying, okay, we're going to, we're looking for deals, looking for deals. We're looking for operators, I should say. And okay, we have the operators and we have, you know, okay, we're going to put 5 million out in these, you know, trust me, we're going to do it. And, and the people have that trust, which is important. Right. So is it when you're saying, you know, we're going to raise money in September for October 1st, is it that was a call date and you've got to find a deal or it's, um, you know, you have people committed, say, I will go up to 50. Let me know when you need whatever percent. And then you wait until you find the deal. And then it's somewhat typical to, you know, where our raise will, we'll have, you know, we'll put under contract, we'll have 60, 90 days to go out and do the due diligence and then close. Is it the same thing, but you just got the commitments 
way earlier? Well, what we've done is we've spent a good part of the last year and a half vetting these operators, <clears throat> you know, getting to know them. And in our case right now in the in Wellings Income Fund, we're actually, um, we're actually investing with operators who have a steady deal flow. Mm -hmm. So we already know this operator really well that we're going to invest with October 1st. He's closed on, I think, four deals already since July 1st. Oh, wow. And um, he's, got a, he's got a team of four or five people working the phones literally full time, each one calling 100 to 200 mobile home park or self-storage owners a day when they're, they've got lists of tens of thousands of these, you know, cell phones and office phones. And so they've got a great deal flow. So we already know that we're going to be investing with that group again for the second time on October 1st. So we'll probably reopen the fund September 15th or so, leave it open for a couple of weeks. And then whatever we have on October 1st, we'll invest that with them. And then we'll probably do it again later in year, the year. Okay. What, uh, cause I think it's, a uh, another interesting topic. You're kind of on the other side of the coin. Um, you know, as a, even though you're more sophisticated in the fund, you're vetting deals to invest in, even if it's, I don't know if any of it's your own personal money or other people's money. What are some of the things you look for in sponsors or syndicators as you're vetting them that is attractive to you or like things you need to see things you would like to see, you know, what's some of the criteria you look for? I'm going to answer that. And then I'm going to end that with uh, asking you guys a question as well. So <laughs> remind me of that. Um, <clears throat> so we have a 21 point checklist. We are looking for, I mean, this is, this may sound funny, but we're looking for a really good gut feeling. Mm -hmm. We don't ignore that because, you know, if there are it's like some oil, Texas oil man told me once, if there are flies buzzing around, there's probably some BS down below. <laughs> and um, so he says, if he sees one, one fly, he shows the person to the door. He won't even talk to him anymore. Um, but uh, we look for that. We look at how they treat their staff, how they treat their investors. We try to talk to previous investors, previous staff. That's really hard to do. Mm -hmm. Their current staff, see how they treat the waiter at the restaurant. We look in their eyes. We talk to them. Uh, that's kind of subjective stuff. We also looked at some of the objective stuff. You know, what type of returns have they had in the past? Are they audited or reviewed? Mm -hmm. um, what type of projections are they using? What type of cap rates? What type of pro formas, rent increases? How have they performed in the past? What's their acquisition pipeline like? Um, and um, there are a number of other things. You know, are they using professional software? Are they using professional portals to manage their investments? Do they have a W-2 internal team? that has lived through and even thrived through the last recession or are they newer in this asset class? You know, those are important things to us. That's a, a real big one right there. Sure. Um, but the last question I would ask, you know, and I'm going to throw it back at you guys is skin in the game. We are, it's really important that they have cash in the game, but, I will tell you that we interviewed a potential sponsor the other day and he gave the same answer to that question. Everything checked the box right down the line until that question. And he said, no, we don't put any skin in the game. And the reason we don't is we get non-recourse debt and we have to <laughs> save up a lot of money to have a lot of liquidity to sign on the loan. For us to be able to serve all of our investors best, we have to have a good deal of net worth and liquidity so we can sign on more debt. And I'll tell you guys, that's the same exact answer that my mentor gave when people asked him if he had skin in the game. He hasn't put skin in the game in like eight years, yet he has tremendous track record and lots of really, you know, uh, very happy investors. Mm -hmm. So my question to you, and like I said, it, it is important to us that they put skin in the game. What do you think of that? Do you guys think that's really important that an operator have skin in the game? Or do you buy the argument that that guy gave that, you know, I need to save up my liquidity to get more debt? It's funny. Because when you, when you proposed it, I laughed. When you went, I knew where you were going with it. When I said, well, I need the liquidity, right? So every deal that we've invested in, we've been no less, mm -hmm. and, and I could be wrong, but I think that we've been at least 30 to 40% of the capital, mm -hmm. personally. Myself, Don, my partner, and immediate family, his father, my mother, you know, it, it's immediate, right? And we've been 30 to 40%. And 
30, 40% is probably on the low end. Like we just did a deal in Jacksonville. Uh, it was 17 million, $15 million raise or $8 million. So, so I, I tell people all the time when we're talking to investors that, yes, I personally believe that you need money in the deal. Now I, I would buy, I definitely would buy. It's interesting. It, it's very interesting. I would buy the concept that I need the liquidity except for the fact that I don't know if I was an investor and the guy said, well, I need the liquidity. It's like, wait a second, all the money you're making, you, you like, or you're, you're, you're putting together, like, why, why aren't you liquid? Why are you doing deals of that size? If you can't put your own money, like, mm -hmm. cause it's funny. Cause when I first started, I put as much as I could into my deals, but now I'm on the flip side where I love having 230 investors. At what I say all the time, but we have one deal where it's I have I'm in I'm ten percent of the equity, and you know there's two other investors in the deal that make up the other eight, uh, ninety percent. Give me four of those deals where I don't have to have thirty investors or twenty investors. Mm -hmm. I would gladly put all my money where my mouth is on you know four deals for the next couple of years and cash flow on those and not have to really worry about a split. So it, it, that's the best answer you could give for no skin in the game. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I personally think I still want the operator to put money in. And we go one further. When I say we're, you know, 40%, that's net of the fee. So if it's, you know, $200,000 fee, we're not, oh, we'll put 200 grand in. We're, no, we're 40%, take that 200 out. Like the day the deal starts, we're 40% of the deal. So I'm a big believer of skin in the game. Mm -hmm. Everything's relative though, right? You know, I, would I invest with someone that does have skin in the game? Of course I would. Um, but we're on the flip side of that. I think why we've been successful is that the other thing I was going to say, and you might've been, you know, going to speak about it. We've bought deals all cash with our own money and we've post syndicated it after we've closed cash. Mm -hmm. So we've gone out to investors and said, Hey, we own this deal. We bought it for 5 million cash. We're going to refinance this now. Do you want to invest? And I think people have felt utterly, you know, a lot of confidence saying, well, if they don't get the money, it's their own money. Yeah. Right. So, I think it's, it's definitely an, a more low pressure sale. It's low pressure. It's like, Hey, listen, we're offering this up to you. Do you want to do it or not? If you do great, if not watch it, cause we're in it ourselves. I think that skin in the game is important, Yeah. but I think track record, I think the biggest thing, like you said before, and I, I'm a big believer, I say it all the time. You could check off every single box in the world. If, if you go to a deal and you don't have a feeling and you don't have that feeling, like a gut feeling when you're meeting the sponsor, you're meeting the investor, don't do it. Right. Cause mm -hmm. I can give you closing statement after closing statement for deals we bought, deals we sold. They sold great profits. Uh, I could show you the one side where it's like, wow, wow, Toro made nothing. I could show you the side where Toro made millions. But at the same time, I think that you got to have a gut check. I think yeah. that's the most important thing. Skin in the game is great. There's, there's, a, there's a rebuttal for every question. I think the most important thing from my standpoint, and I'll let you speak about it next, is you got to have a feeling. I got to look you in the eyes and I got to like you. I got to trust you. And I got to know if something goes sideways, you, you're going you're gonna to roll your sleeves and go to bat. You're not just going to pull the ripcord and bail. I think right. that's more important than anything else. Yeah, I think for me, the skin in the game is obviously important, but I wouldn't be shocked if the person you were talking to is probably somewhat newer. Is that right? No, actually, uh, especially my mentor, they were, they've been around since before the recession. And I think this group I'm talking about has as well. They said we're not independently wealthy, though. It's not like we have tens of millions of dollars to throw around. So. Yeah, I think, I think that's just a problem. I think, you know, being in the nature of this business requires you to have money, to have skin in the game, to also go out and be able to get non-recourse debt. So if you're somebody who doesn't have tens, twenties, fifties, you know, millions of dollars, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to scale. So you've either got to hold some money back or you've got to go out and get a partner that can help you sign on the loan. That's, you know, we're, you know, we're fortunate enough to have yes. that component of it as well. But, you know, you know, we also offer percentage ownership for that as well. So I, I would counter why wouldn't they just go out and get a partner and invest some more of their own money and, you know, kind of give that person some of the, you know, general partnership side to be on that deal because it allows you to invest in the deals you own while maintaining the, you know, requirements. So, I mean, I don't know. I think it's interesting why somebody wouldn't go that route. I don't see a lot of downside to it unless you've already got six partners and now you bring in a seventh for 30% yeah. and you're now you're whittled down to 5%, you know, you're going to, work hard for your money, but now you're, it's just, you're only working for your money. You're not really getting any upside. 
where the complete opposite is if you have no skin in the game, you know, you're only working for the upside, you're not working for your own money. So I think the best is kind of a balance of, you know, how much I'd be curious to see how much the person actually operating the deal on a day to day, you know, how much money do they have in, you know, as a percentage of, you know, ownership as well as how much of the upside are they getting? Cause, cause I think those are some of the main drivers for the sponsor. So if one is really hamstringed over the other, you know, it may be great. They might have, you know, $250,000 in the deal, but if they're a 10% general partner on a, you know, 25, $30 million deal, they're not going to work as hard as a guy who has a hundred, 150, but is getting half of that. You know, there's a lot more upside meat on the bones incentive for them on the back end. So I think, you know, it's probably a sliding scale between the two. I think probably to either side of one end is probably not healthy, like everything in life. Right. Um, but obviously I think, you know, like he said, the track record is important. I think for me also too, especially in the multifamily space, and I'm sure with the mobile homes and the self storage, I'm sure cap rates have helped 98, if not a hundred percent of every person that's bought a deal in the last seven years. I, 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 say that all the time. I think you've also got to look at, you know, their budget versus what actually has happened more so than just a return. That's it, good. You could, have a, you could have a 30 IRR on paper. It doesn't really mean shit. If you bought it at an eight <laughs> cap and you sold it at a five, you could have, your NOI could have dropped, you know, 10% and, you made- and you'd probably still make it 30. So I think you, looking at, you know, anybody can put a 30 IRR on paper in the last seven years. I think how you got to that number is probably that's very good. good. I, so that's what I was going to say. I say, I think more importantly is, I tell people all the time, I said, listen, I, the first property I bought was in 2009, right? So there was a recession. It happened to me like shortly thereafter. Have I gone through a recession? No. As my partner, yes, two times, right? He's, you know, he's been, he was a broker for 30 plus years. He's been investing for a long time. So I have that background. He's been there. He's seen it. But I tell people all the time, listen, I've bought deals today or I've sold deals today that I bought when anyone would have made money. And there are things I think what's more important, like let's say you don't have the track record through yeah. the recession, but I know what my mistake was. The market helped me. Mm-hmm. And I'm the first to admit, I say, listen, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I didn't fire my manager quick enough here. I did not execute this business plan. I started doing interiors and I should have done exteriors. So I think learning from your successes, you know, people say you have to learn from your failures. Of course, right? If you're not, then you're probably not in business for much longer, yeah. but learning from your successes so you don't make the mistake if something goes sideways. Yeah. And your, your micro losses instead of your macro losses. Exactly. And I think that that's important. But, you know, from, I have a question for you because, you know, we have an investment in Jacksonville. It's 82 units. We're getting ready to sell it most likely. And when we did the deal, we have skin in the game. We put mm-hmm. uh, 20, 20, 15% or 20% in the deal. Um, and our equity partner gave us a nine pref 70, 30 over. So right now there is clearly an opportunity in the deal. We're selling it. It is a value add deal. It's an amazing deal. It really is. But the question I have for you is that I, we argued for a second hurdle and they said, no. So I said, okay, whatever, that's fine. But now is the perfect time where that second hurdle would incentivize us to stay in the deal because we've renovated how many units? You know, 20 to 30, 20 to 30 units. I would say. And there's a clear opportunity to renovate more units, push rents, and then potentially instead of selling it for 75 a door, selling it for 85 a door. Probably but even more. Probably even more because there are deals selling for more. But from our standpoint as a sponsor, and this is where the syndication business goes a little sideways, is that. If I sell it for 75 a door today, I, I hit my, we've, hit our, we've hit our pref in cash flow. So it's a 70-30 split. If I sell it for X or I sell it for X plus 10,000 a door, 70-30 on 82 units is only 200 grand more in the sponsor's pocket. There's no incentive whatsoever for me to own that, except for my investment would do a little better. Mm-hmm. So the question I have for you is when you're looking to invest with a sponsor, if – what do you want the sponsor to do to incentivize the investment? Because a lot of sponsor transaction based, it's an acquisition fee, it's a disposition fee, a refinance fee, a construction mm-hmm. manager fee. You know, you're really supposed to do right for the investor, but sometimes you look at a deal, you're like, wow, opportunity, opportunity. we should sell this one, buy that one, get a fee, and then you know, execute that deal a little bit better because this one's doing okay. So the question is, what are you know, what do you want to see from an investor or what do you want to see from a sponsor and an operator to incentivize them to either hold it or operate it better? 
Well, you just said a lot and um, I, <laughs> that's fairly typical. No, that's great. So I was going to ask you this question anyway, and I don't think I'm answering it very well because I mean, I, 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 you know, I don't know if you know, guys know Ian Ippolito. Ian is a really successful tech guy. He made a ton of money in tech, had a really successful company. You probably heard of the company. I can't remember what it is right now, but he's now investing in commercial multifamily and other deals, commercial real estate. He's got a pretty big following of thousands of people who read his articles and he vets, ruthlessly vets sponsors in the commercial real estate arena. And he, um, he is arguing in an article recently that you shouldn't have a preferred return. And I'm thinking, wait, well, I thought you were for the investor. And he's, and he basically in the article said a preferred return does a couple things that are actually counterintuitively bad for the investor. One, he said it makes the sponsor actually take more risks because they have to pass that hurdle and so then they take more risks that can often hurt the investor because they're trying to, you know, get way past that hurdle and they're, they sometimes take risks that hurt the investor, hurt the deal. The second thing, which I wouldn't have thought of originally he said is if you get a couple bad years, a sponsor, let's say they get into a deal and oh. they're like <laughs> two years behind on paying their pref. Let's say it's a nine pref. Now they're 18%. They've got to pay the investor. And let's say they only pay out 2% a year. Now they're, let's say, 14% behind. And they might, the sponsor might just, in you know, like gut in their gut. They might go, why am I working for free? I'll never make a penny from this. I'm going to move on and focus on something else now. And it might actually incentivize the sponsor to either, you know, directly or maybe even subtly kind of give up. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that, guys? I agree with that last point 100%. Oh, so I say it all the time. So our good buddy, Reed, um, Reed Goosens, yeah. got his podcast. He's a great guy. He's been on Paul's. He's been on ours. Um, yeah, we just had this conversation. I think you did the first part. I did the second part of his little series talking about like lowering investor expectations and that, because that's the point of this business to send the flawed syndication model. You just touched on it. Who knows first if the deal is going to work or not? It's not the investor. It's the right. sponsor. Right. So if I know the deal is not going to perform. I'm actively trying to sell it, get out, move that capital into a new deal and you know, reinvest it, charge a higher fee and, I'll offset my initial mistake by a new deal and, you know, we'll wash it away, whatever. And I'm not saying we've done that, but that's the side of the sponsor that I truthfully talk about. I tell people all the time, preferred returns hurt deals because if we miss, I have no incentive to make money. That's where skin in the game yeah. is super important. Right. We have a deal that's performed moderately. It's a 1990s built deal. It's been like a five-ish, 6% cash on cash. We thought it'd be better. We thought we'd put a supplemental on it. It hasn't worked. We're $5 million of the $7 million invested. We've waived our asset management fee for the life of the deal because our investment's making money. Yeah. So as a sponsor, there's no pref in that deal either. But as a sponsor, we have the ability to, you know, okay, 2% in the document on an asset management fee, we're waiving it because our investment's making money. So we're not necessarily, okay, we're not hitting the press, but we're making money because we're investors. So that's where I think skin in the game is important. For sure. But I do like, you know, he makes a, he makes a great point. I think I've seen that he's, he writes articles on bigger pockets, right? I don't know if he does or not. I, I know right. I've seen the name somewhere. I don't know where it was, but it's an argument that I would argue for all day long. We give prefs on our deals. We do an eight pref, mm -hmm. but our deals are also heavy lifting. So, we know there's no cash flow year one, so we know that going in. But I think that I personally believe as an investor, you know, what I did on my first deal ever was it was an alternative. I did no pref, but on sale, 10% was paid out first before there was a hurdle. So it was an 80-20 split for the life of the deal. But when we sold it, let's just say I gave you six year one, eight year two, yeah. I would accrue you to 10 and then we'd split the deal over 10. But I would make money while the deal was going on so I could feed myself. Right. That was an alternative because I got some pushback with no pref, but I was able to figure out another structure. I think prefs hurt sponsors today because deals are not performing the way that they're underwritten because there's just, you know, they're selling at four caps. If you buy a deal at a four cap and your debt is four and a half, mm -hmm. you can't, you're never going to hit a pref in year one. Yeah. It just right. doesn't work. So right. 
I agree. I, I don't, I, I think that prefs hurt deals, but it's like market now. So if you don't do it, you get pushed back. Well, you know, what do you mean? You're not doing a pref. I can yeah. go invest with this guy with a pref. Doesn't mean the deal's going to work though. That's yeah. the problem. I think right. too, if, you know, if you had some more money coming in every month and you knew it, you know, you might lower an acquisition fee up front. What's an extra, you know, 10, 20, $30,000 a month, depending upon $5,000 a month, depending on size of the deal, if you really need a 2% or you could do 1%, especially if you have your own money in the deal, you're just lowering your cost basis. Yep. Every percent you add on an acquisition fee raises your cost basis, raises, you know, the, uh, excuse me, lowers the return you're going to get. Not a, not a huge amount, obviously. It's not turning a 10 into a 20 by any means, but you know, if you can get that out, right? If you can say, hey, I can either go 1%, and take out a pref or go 2% and leave a pref, I'm more incentivized to go longer term. If I'm going to make more money over seven years without a pref than I am up front in an acquisition fee. You're talking about, let's say it was $102,000. I may hit that $100,000 in three or four years. I am now incentivized to hold that deal for yes. six, seven, nine, ten 10 years because I'm going to make more money over the life of the deal than I would with that extra point up front. It's also lowering the cost basis for sale, refinance, things of that nature. So I think there's absolutely a way to structure to incentivize a longer term hold for investors, especially if, you know, like I think you guys, your funds are like seven or 10 years, right? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think it, <clears throat> not having a pref or, or a recapture of pref, something like that would definitely incentivize a longer term hold from, you know, an operational side. Yeah. Right. I think so too. So exactly. So I think, I think the other underlying thing here is that you got to have the wherewithal and understanding your investors. And if you were going to invest in one of our deals, having this open communication, right? The questions you're asking are great from a sponsor standpoint, right? I do 3% acquisition fee and an eight pref. Well, would you want me to do a 1% acquisition fee and no pref? It probably on the back end and the yearly, it probably makes more sense to do it the other way, but some people are so hell bent in their way. They don't even think outside the box, but mm -hmm. I think having the open dialogue is more important than, you know, this no. is our structure, deal with it. It's like, no, listen, if, if you're, if you're putting in 80% of the equity and I'm 20%, let's have a conversation, yeah. right? What, yeah. what would you rather see? Let me play with the model. Let me right. see if it works. And, and that's the more important part. But I agree. I agree with that article. I think mm -hmm. that there are structures out there today. And what do I talk about so frequently that sponsors shoot themselves in the foot out of the box because they structured a deal wrong. Mm -hmm. And now they're working for free. And now their yeah. eyes, the, the eyes off the ball, it's off the target. And the, the investor suffers because the sponsors not making money. And I think, right that's where investors get greedy mm -hmm. and sometimes sponsors don't even realize what they're doing until eight months, six months, 12 months, two years down the road. They're like, Oh God, this truck. Yeah. I'm never going to make an yeah. exit. So I think, right. I yeah. I think a part of it too is like, I've seen a lot of structures recently where it's like eight, nine pref, you know, 75, 80, 70, 30 over that. And then like a 50, 50 over 18. Yeah. You're, you know, on paper, everyone's probably thinking how much I can make if things go right, but nobody's thinking the complete opposite. They're thinking, oh, I'm going to make, you know, they're not thinking, oh, I'm going to make nothing if this returns 6% a year for the next seven years. Right. Nobody's really thinking about the converse side. They're always, you know, they see all the big dollar signs. They hear all the podcasts all returned 30 IRR in seven months for, you know, investor and I put 200 grand in my pocket. They hear about that and they go, oh, well, what I can do, I can actually bump up the second hurdle, but lower. And if I do that, I'll put way more. And it's like, that's great. But those deals are now becoming, you know, few and far between, like you were saying, 93% yeah. of deals are professionally managed. It's not happening anymore. You're not really buying a, a 35 IRR from a professionally managed group unless something drastically changes. Right. right. So right. that, that high hurdle that I've seen a couple of times now, I'm like, and I would take that. I would, as a sponsor, uh, as an investor, I would yeah, give it to me. <laughs> I was like, you're not going to take anything until I hit in 18. That's fantastic. And then even then it's 50, 50. I'm like, that's, that's like almost a borderline preferred equity piece. Yeah. It really what it is. Let me ask you a question. Cause I got another one for you. Um, in regards to that, would you rather a sponsor like have the ability and the flat, like, okay, yeah, let's talk about it. Or do you want them to be like, cause it's a confidence thing, right? If I come to you saying, Hey, we're going to do this. And you say, wait a second, what about this? Uh, you know, having the flexibility and the communication, people look at it two ways. One, he's not, you know, he doesn't have conviction. 
The other side of it is, ah, you know what, maybe he's a little, uh, you know, he's all over the place. Or, no, I'm telling you we're going to deliver it. What do you think is, I think obviously the feel's there, so you got to get the feel, but what is more important to you? The, the flexibility or the conviction? I mean, if I'm talking to a sponsor that I know pretty well and I've already vetted, I, I would love to have the, uh, you know, potential flexibility going into the new year, uh, you know, going into a new fund or a new deal to have that discussion, especially if I'm their largest investor, you know, yep. but I, uh, that's just, that's just what I think, you know, I, I could, I haven't really thought that through before. No, because because I tell you know sometimes people you know you're really confident. Like we did, a, we have a, a monthly meetup that we do all the time, and you know we'll bring people in. And, and we were there was four of us up there. It was Chris, myself, and two other sponsors. And one guy in the audience is like, "You're just so much more confident." And he literally, yeah. you're, "You're so much more confident than those guys." I'm like, "That's because I'm dumber." I, you know, I <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm just you know I'm confident, but I'm also not an idiot, right? You know, mm -hmm. I, I'll listen if someone if one of my biggest investors is telling me, "Hey." you know, let's, let's think about a more creative structure or something that's yeah. more incentivized. Sure. I'm, yeah. I'm all ears, but you know, I know some people like that confidence out of the box where they're like, no, no, no. Like you're waffling. Like we want, right. we want you to be all in, but you know, yeah. who knows? Right. Hey, I have a question for you guys. So we have a mutual friend, John, who just came out with a deal that we're aware of that uh, he offered a 25% of his investors, a 10% pref with no upside. They get 10%. It doesn't accrue because there's only 25% of the investors at most in that. He only has to make 2.5% on cash flow to give all that 25% of the people yep. the 10% cash flow per year, but they get no upside at all. The other group, the other 75%, get a seven or eight prep. I think it's seven. And then uh, I think it's 70 30 split. And their IRR is projected 1.5% higher because the first group, the 10% only with no upside, actually, because they're not getting an upside, there's more left in upside for that second group. What do you guys think of that? I'm thinking, man, that's a great idea. Some people just would be happy to get 10% flat. They don't really believe in the appreciation anyway. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm thinking about putting that in as my, uh, as a potential for my fund structure next year. What do you guys think? Love it. I, I love it. That's, that's where our, our debt fund came mm -hmm. from. It was basically giving our investors the opportunity to take advantage of a flat fee yeah. And, and then them to also take advantage of the upside. I think it's a great structure because, you know, we've bought, I, you know, we've owned 1960s C-class properties that I would love the upside on. But if you gave me 10% and you gave me quarterly distributions, I would take it because it's like, you know what? It's a hedge to, you know, I don't think you're going to hit your upside anyway. I'm secured in some way, shape or form that I get 10 out first. Uh, I think, I think that's an, like for a guy like you with a, you know, with your, you know, the, the fund, you know, you could do like a, you know, a two, you know, I think it's extremely attractive to have investors take advantage. Hey guys, we're going to invest 80, 20 with this sponsor. 70% is going to be upside 10, you know, 10% is going to be at a flat fee. And I think that you can get creative with it. I think there's a huge appetite in today's market for a guaranteed or as close to guaranteed yeah, yeah. For, there's a huge appetite for it i i'm ri less risky yeah it's yeah. significantly less risky i'm i'm actively and i bang my head against the wall every day and ask chris i want to get to monthly distributions in our company like every single minute i'm like just even if it's a dollar people love getting money back yeah. And I think that if you can get that 10 or that, that, that fixed number, I mean, it's, it's an extremely attractive thing. I love it. I mean, we would gladly take the money at, you know, a flat fee because we, you know, you're right. You don't have to hit a high cash on cash to pay that person out. And then everyone else gets to take advantage of that flat, you know, everyone else is getting, it's like extra leverage without it being like overly levered. Yeah. I think, I do think it's a, a creative and great, idea. I think you've obviously got to have the investors that are willing to take less cash flow as the rest because it is being offset by the 10% you're giving. So you've got to have the slightly different needs of somebody else. If somebody really likes that, you know, six, seven, eight percent cash flow a year, they're probably not going to get that the first couple of years, if at all, with the new prep structure. So right. they've got to be willing to give that up to get slightly higher return on the yeah. back end. That's right. I think it works better for shorter time frame deals than if you were going yeah. five, six, seven, 10 year deals. I don't know if it's going to work as well, unless 
you're doing such a big renovation, you can get your cash flow way up, you know, by the third, fourth year. So they're getting, you know, five to seven years of regular cash flow and they're eating it on the first couple of years. Um, maybe that would work. But I think, again, I think those are, those are tougher to find. Um, I think you've just got to, you know, you've just got to have the investors for kind of both sides of the coin. You've also got to make sure you don't over leverage the 25%, I think is more than safe, especially considering, you know, just the, the deal itself and knowing who it is. I think the problem that people are going to start doing is they're going to start bumping that number up and it's going to, you know, where debt providers will look at coverage ratios and not necessarily LTVs. And I think a lot of people struggle to understand that, especially when they first get involved. Mm-hmm. I think you've got to look at it kind of a similar way. What's your coverage ratio and what, what number do you look for? You're yep. not going to look for a one two five coverage ratio. You're probably gonna have to be like a two three. I don't even know. Like, I don't know what, a, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I don't, I'd have to look at it and dig in more and kind of stress test and be like, okay, what's a coverage ratio that I want to hit. And I don't know that there's enough I think sophisticated that, people that are going to understand that. So I think a lot of people, yeah. if they start implementing the structure, there's going to be an ease of use to abuse that, to give those people that are looking for 10%. I think that's great, right? I think anybody or there's a, a large appetite for people that would take 10% monthly cash flow um, you know, not 10% a month, 10% annually. Yeah, right, right. Every month. They would take that on, you know, any multifamily deal with no upside. I think there's a ton of people that would take that, um, especially if they're getting still the benefits. But I think if they start offering too much and it's going to jack up the back end return, just like any, you know, if you over leverage any deal with debt, if things start to go south, you know, at what point do you start missing? And then what is the legal language on oh, yeah. payments? Is it you have to, do it and take it out of your pocket? Like, is it a, you know, a real guaranteed? Is it, you know, is it like a debt payment where they can foreclose or is it, you know, is it a 10% pref where, Hey, if we get to it, great, if not, no, like then it's going to come to how do you structure it? So I think there's a a lot of room for abuse for people if you start to get too aggressive. So I think it's great if you don't overdo it is it's also going to depend too on, you know, what's the debt on the property. If you have a 50% loan, go for it. If you've got an 80% loan to cost, I would never do it. I think quality of asset too. Yeah, for right? sure. You don't want to, you know, you can, and location, you know, real estate always comes down to, you know, where is it, right? You know, path of progress, self-storage, that could be a covered bland play at a nine cap, you know, you know, lever it up 150%, who cares, right? Because you, you, your 10 year debt, you know, your 10 year, you know, you could develop it. So yeah. I think your locate, I think that's where, you know, your coverage ratio and understanding it's going to get a little, little yeah, I just think Crazy. if you're going to the mom and pop investor, you're going to... No, no, of course. But uh, no, I think I think it's a great option given, you know, you have a 21 point of contact to vet a sponsor. I'm sure you're using something similar to vet a deal. And as long as it checks off the boxes, you know, okay, yes, we'll do that. But it's got to be a 65 to 70% LTV mm-hmm. where I can put a 10% pref on that. I don't want you to lever mm-hmm. it up at 85%, go put a 10% pref and you have 5% equity in the deal. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I have 50 grand in the deal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Throw this one in the garbage because it's not working. Yeah. So I think all those factor in, but I think if you can structure it the right way, it's a super, everyone makes more money and the guy that's conservative gets his conservative piece. Yeah. One of the things the sponsor did, you probably know this, John, is he allowed uh, investors to mix their investments. So if they're putting in a hundred thousand, they may go half in one and half in class, class A, half in class B. So they, you know, they can mix it up a little bit. I think that that's where that structure becomes really attractive. Yeah, me too. I agree. Investors in the deal take advantage of both sides. So, you know, they're, you know, are they going to foreclose on themselves? Probably not. Um, not. But, but, you know, the, it, it gives them the benefit. They get the upside on a part and they also get the. Wouldn't though, like, let's say hypothetically, every person that put into that pref piece it gets also a little, put in, it just eliminates the, the whole part. You right? have, yeah, you have to, you have to say, you know, we're accepting X ex- it, it's total dollars. And it, I mean, you got to get creative with it, yeah. but, but yes, it would. <laughs> yeah, defeats, absolutely. It somewhat defeats the purpose, but. <laughs> well, no, not if you cap it, like 25% of its pref. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If everyone wants to split it in half, you can't. Everyone's got to split it in a quarter. Yeah, right. Gotcha. So, but that, yeah, but, but it, 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 that's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. You yeah. just got to make sure that everyone understands it. No, no, for sure. It's a great structure. Yeah. So what's, um, what's some upsides you're seeing guys on the mobile home parks? I mean, you know, you hear people say there's huge upsides, value adds you can do on apartments, you can do kitchens and bathrooms and flooring and lighting and paint and exteriors. 
what do you do at a mobile home park with 1970s and 80s uh, mobile homes? I mean, I, I have some ideas, but I want to hear what you guys are thinking. Uh, so professional, m- m- managing it professionally, I think is the easiest one, right? You know, the, the, a lot of this is mom and pop where, uh, you know, he pays me when he, when he has the money, you know, really setting the standard straight and obviously given market, you know, upgrading homes, making them, you know, some people have disheveled, you know, the, the skirting's ripped off or it's coming in good, clean roads, yeah. nice sign, professional management, run it like a well-oiled machine is where I see the most value. Obviously, you know, a 1970s home is a 1970s home. You can't make it look, you can make it look nice, but you can't make it look new, or I don't wanna say new, but I think the biggest value is mom and pop management that maybe it's under market rent, and then simultaneous just cleaning up the operations and making it yeah. clean. And then billing back water because, you know, people don't use about it, submetering the water and just keeping mm-hmm. everything, you know, running smoothly. I think that's the biggest upside in my opinion. Yeah, right. You know, the, the operational side, I think just goes hand in hand with any property. I think the landscaping and maintenance side makes a huge yeah. Anything and absolutely cleaning up the trash like keeping all the trash in one area oh or yeah. making sure there's nothing on the property having somebody walk through it um i think ha- you know if you have somebody there that fosters relationships as right. well that's probably a huge thing i mean he's more in it than i am on the day-to-day so i'm less you know nitty-gritty on everything but you know just from a i could see easily if there's a you know a, a vacant owner is that i guess an absentee absentee, owner. absentee owner yeah that's the word i was thinking mm-hmm. of you know, if you can have somebody there all the time checking in, making sure things are okay, people like knowing somebody's looking after them, taking care of, especially if you're buying a park that's been owned for 40 God years. knows how long by somebody that's just kind of oh, letting, yeah. you know, some things just kind of run into the ground a little bit. Right. Even on our, you know, multifamily stuff, you come in, you just clean operations from somebody, tenants love it. And they're, you know, if you just clean it up and take care of things, they're willing to take increases. So and- I think- what he's saying, the operational, just take care of stuff side. I mean, there's multi-billion the dollar businesses think, that buy small businesses and just operate them the, better. Than I think the pride of, of ownership, stuff. the pride yeah, of ownership that's big. is probably the biggest one. What about you? What do you, where, where do you, what do you like to yeah, see? Yeah. So I'm actually going through Frank and Dave's mobile home park course right now. And uh, he says <laughs> the number one thing to do is raise rents. Of course, you guys may have heard he was slaughtered on John Oliver recently for, yeah, I heard about that. it was hysterical. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, it was funny and he admitted it was funny, by the way. I, I know Frank a little bit, but uh, at any rate, uh, not all accurate. But um, yeah, number two is billing back water and sewer. Uh, number three is probably filling vacant lots. And that sometimes take a professional operator because if there's 10% of the lots vacant, well, as a mom and pop, often they're not going to drag in new or even used homes to uh, to fill those lots and then sell those to um, you know, to tenant buyers. But uh, as a professional, you can do that. The, mo- the coolest story I've heard in a while is a deal we invested in. We have our Wellings Income Fund that has a 10-year window. And we recently invested in a deal. And I'm going to use some rounded numbers here. And uh, I'm also a little hypothetical. I'm not saying this. You know how at the end of the day, it may turn out different when you go to sell the asset than you're projecting. But so I'm, I want to make that disclaimer here since I am <laughs> talking about all your bases. Yeah, cover you. Paul said they made 400%. Paul said, <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, seriously, I think this will demonstrate the power of commercial real estate investing. And I think this will speak to why most of the Forbes 400 wealth Wealthiest Americans invest in commercial real estate. Uh, this park, and again, I'm using round numbers here, was purchased for $5 million. That's $3 million in debt plus $2 million in equity. So 60% loan to value ratio, somewhat conservative. Now, this, uh, the operator went in, the asset manager, and he said, gosh, there's uh, some of these mobile homes have three or four or five or six cars sitting out front and a work trailer and an RV and a boat. We got to clean this place up. Well, he noticed there was an acre out front of vacant land and he didn't have, you know, a permit to put in more spaces. So he paved that acre, put a nice fence and a gate around it. And he said, okay, if you had a third or fourth car or an RV or work trailer or boat, you've got to put it in here and pay us to keep it here. So the first thing that did is it cleaned up the park and allowed him to raise rents a little bit more. It also allowed him to get, you know, lure new tenants in. But when this 
paved area is filled up with the tenants stuff. He's going to advertise on Craigslist for boat and RV parking. And when he's done, he's going to be able to charge about $10,000 total per month for this paid parking. Now he paid a hundred thousand dollars to pave and fence this area. So at full occupancy, he'll be getting about 120,000 a year or 120% annual ROI. That sounds great, but it's better than that. And you guys know why? Because when this, uh, the value formula in commercial real estate, as you know, is net operating income divided by cap rate. Now cap rates for these professionally managed parks now are as low as 5%, but let's assume six, $120,000 in increased income, divided by a 6% cap rate or 0 0.06 is $2 million he just added to the value of the park. Now, he only paid 5 million, 2 million equity. All the equity, all the new equity flows to the equity holders. Therefore, the 2 million in equity just became 4 million or the equity was doubled on this one move. That doesn't include filling up more spaces, billing back water, raising rents, one change. Now it's a big change, it was an important change, but they doubled the equity holder's stake or they basically gave them 100% appreciation on their equity just by this one change. It's powerful and this is how you can drive appreciation at a mom and pop purchased facility right there. Yep, that that's in a nutshell, and that's where, you know, the deals we have, and you know, I, I'm gonna Paul, I'm gonna send them to you because I think that they're interesting just to look at. I mean, I I love. We have three people in the office that cold call all day. Wow. Across deals, and that's how we've been able to shake a lot of these loose. Uh, I love when I go into the office and they're like, "Here's five deals," and we talk through them because the stories, and it's like, wow look at this. It's, you know, there's 20% vacancy. Does the market support it? But forget filling the lots, forget billing it back. You look at the expenses and the guy's paying a manager $20,000. I don't even use a six cap. I use a 10 cap. I'm like, all right, 20 grand, 10 cap it, $200,000 in value. We're buying the park for 600 grand. I mean, that alone, you, you do little tweaks like that. Yeah. And you know, am I a professional mobile home park operator? No. But you know, the common sense and the power of commercial real estate, and it's not buying a single family house and I don't like the color of the grout, so I'm not going to buy it. It's all right. It's a, t it's a seven cap. I'll take it, right? Mm -hmm. there, there's a buyer for it. You know it. And that's the, like you said, that formula is how you make a lot of money or you know, as an investor, as in a manager, whatever it is, is being able to tweak the operations and that goes straight to the bottom line. You cap mm -hmm. it. And there you go. So it's, right. you just hit the nail on the head and you add those other things in and your $120,000 income goes to 240, you know, six cap. Great. 10 cap. It's 2.4 million. Your equity was 2 million. So it's just, yeah. uh, it's really powerful. It's really interesting. Um, you see that a lot more on that space than you do in the, you know, multifamily that doesn't exist anymore. It's not like yeah. I'm going to go in and sub meter and bill back 40 bucks. It's like, no, that's not, you know, that was done five years ago. And now, right. now you got to go, you know, you got to go spend $12,000 door renovating and hope you get a hundred bucks. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, awesome. I think that was uh, a ton of great stuff and a really good kind of place to wrap it up. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. You gave us uh, a lot of insight you want to tell. Uh, everybody where they can get in touch with you, learn more about you. Um, I know you've got a, a podcast and some other stuff. Absolutely. So I've got a podcast called How to Lose Money. It's a wealth building podcast and you guys are welcome to be guests on there. Uh, HowToLoseMoney.com. It's also on iTunes. I have a book called The Perfect Investment. It's about multifamily mm -hmm. and uh, that's on Amazon and, and uh, people can reach out to me at my website. It's WellingsCapital.com. That's W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S Capital.com. Fantastic. I also, just to note, I love your website. I think it's so oh, well thanks. put together and very informative. So definitely go and, check it out. And I could say this not because he's sitting here listening or visually. Paul's one of the good guys. I I don't, if I put a, you know, I, I could say anyone that listens to this podcast, Paul, will give you the time. He'll talk to you. He's got a really good thing going. And I, I you know, I've known him for a couple of years now. We've talked almost at least once a month. We've done some stuff. We've, you know, we shared some investors. Uh, Paul's a good guy. So I recommend everybody go check out his website, check him out, you know, call him, reach out to him. Um, he gets a lot of content, a ton of posts on bigger pockets, valuable information. Thanks, guys. That's awesome. really nice. Thank you.